Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, joint ESS Max for Science Colloquium. Uh, these colloquia are organized by Max for an ESS. And the purpose is to uh, look a little bit at the scientific opportunities that come along with ESS and Max4, and also what science is being done today at neutron and synchrotron sources. Uh, today, we're going to shift our gaze towards the life sciences. We have Professor Paul Nissen with us from Aarhus University. So, Paul, after uh, after doing a PhD at Aarhus, you went to Yale for a few years, and then you came back to your alma mater, where you have established quite an extensive research group uh, covering integrative structural biology, integrative neuroscience, and many other topics. Uh, you're a professor of protein biochemistry and also director for Dandrite, which is the Danish Research Institute, Institute of Translational Medicine, which is a part of the Nordic EMBL Partnership for Molecular Medicine, which is, uh, I think, a really nice uh, brand to be connected to. So there's much going on in your lab, and uh, while being an academic, you're also really a, a key person in providing expert advice, I know, to the Danish Research Agency when it comes to how the Danish community can make best use of ESS and MAX4 uh, in the life sciences. So I think that's a really important uh, role you play as well. Uh, in your lab, you work with membrane transport proteins, biomembrane structure, dynamics, structure-based drug design, and I'm sure many other things. So um, uh, we're going to hear an interesting talk by Paul this afternoon. And if you guys have any questions for him, since we're not in the same room, uh, feel free to email uh, your questions or comments to sciencequestions at ess.eu. So that's sciencequestions, one word, at ess.eu. And they will come to me. And at the end of the talk, I'll read them up and uh, Paul can comment or answer. So, Professor Nissen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sindra. It's a great honor. Uh, and I'm really, I'm really pleased that you invited me to, to present the seminar here. And then since it, it became a, a, a video-based seminar, but I, I think that certainly can work. And I'm very happy to be here today and, and present some of our work. Um, as, as you mentioned, Sindra, so we do very many aspects of what I will call now structural neurobiology in, uh, in my laboratory. Aarhus University covers most aspects of, of, of the life sciences and there's a very active, thriving neurobiology environment uh, where we are also part, uh, not least through Dendrite, the Danish node of the Nordic EMBL partnership, but also through other uh, research activities and research centers. Uh, However, what I would like to show today is, 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 is more focused on the structural biology side of structural neurobiology. Uh, being a, a joint ESS MAX4 science colloquium, I thought I would present some of the things we have been doing with crystallography uh, over the last uh, few years, where we have tried to approach also some new methods that I think are very interesting uh, new approaches. Also, in our discussions of what will come next with MAX4 and, and with um, ESS opportunities uh, for X-ray and neutron-based research. So uh, the outline of my talk will cover, first of all, um, an introduction to a, a family of, of membrane transport proteins, SLC6 transporters, uh, which are sodium-dependent transporters. I'll use an example to sort of come into how we have investigated some mechanistic aspects based on structure. Um, and also some substrate recognition in, in the particular model that I'm using here, the MHST uh, amino acid transporter that we have studied. Um, and I will also then move on to a related protein, uh, the human glycine transporter, glycine transporter T1, GlyT1, uh, which is a new transmitter, well, also uh, an amino acid transporter of the SLC6 family, where we have used <coughs> serial synchrotron crystallography approaches of the first structure determination. And then a, a, a bit extra on, on how we currently try to approach new uh, projects and approaches um, uh, using serial crystallography, uh, and also a bit on, on how we prepare for, for hopefully also in the future neutron crystallography. So SLC6 transporters that I would like to talk about, as I mentioned, they are neurotransmitter transporters. They have very famous uh, examples are the serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine transporters, and the glycine transporter, and also GABA transporter. 
Um, but they also transport amino acids and also, for example, other amine samples and like creatine and beta Um They are, like many other uh, families of transporters, sodium dependent, meaning that the energy comes from the sodium gradient, which is, of course, established by a fantastic enzyme, the sodium potassium pump, which, however, I will not talk about today. There was a huge breakthrough in the studies of transporters in 2005 with the first structure of, of SLT6 transporter homolog, the um, uh, LUT transporter, which was determined by Eric Gouos lab, um, an amino acid transporter, exactly bacteria, uh, and determined in a leucine and sodium bound state, and revealing an, a so called outward oriented occluded state, meaning that the substrate and the, the sodium is, is bound tightly to the protein. It's still outward oriented, uh, so there's also a, 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 a a uh, so-called extracellular vestibule exposed in this site, which is the, the, the binding site, as you can see here in magenta, for example, for some inhibitor classes that are known to affect uh, the transport of, of, of members of this family, um, and where there's also a proposed regulatory S2 site. Um, and then there's, of course, also on the other side of the membrane towards the intracellular environment, maybe some indications from that first structure of an intracellular exchange pathway. But we'll come into that further. Um, we studied since very long time actually another bacterial uh, homolog already since 2001 uh, called uh, the Bacillus halodurans MHST transporter, multi hydrophobic amino acid transporter, um, which is also a bona fide SLC6 transporter, amino acid transporter, sodium dependent, and with a preference for um, yeah, aromatic and um, uh, um, apolar amino acids, aliphatic branched amino acids in particular. We had for a long time crystals in de, uh, with with the uh, MHST solubilized in in detergent only, which was back in the in those days sort of the standard uh, approach for crystallizing membrane proteins. But we never got uh, good diffraction, only to say 15 angstrom resolution over several years uh, and over many different crystal forms. Things changed, however, very dramatically when we added lipids to the mixtures and 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 explored. Uh, other methods we have used and uh, a lot for, for lipid-based crystallization of membrane proteins, a method we call highlight, high lipid detergent with lipid, well, detergent solubilized lipid and protein, and also using uh, lipid cubic phase approaches, uh, LCP, where we have suddenly then got very well diffracting crystals and, and, and new structures of another member of this family. So that gave us actually a very uh, interesting insight into the overall transport mechanism of, of the SLC6 transporters, because what we crystallized was a new functional state, now the inward oriented state, the state, uh, you could say a moment of truth for such a transporter where it's about to release its sodium to the intracellular environment and really commit to uh, the transport event of releasing substrate to the intracellular environment. So we were very interested in, in the question of how does that sodium ion actually get access to the intracellular environment and gets released there. And one thing we noticed was that there was a narrow solvent channel, you can see here in the close up here of a, of a narrow pathway that leads into the driving sodium two site. Uh, we can see there's a solvated cavity in, uh, surrounding it. And actually, if you compare to the uh, outward oriented LUT structure that I showed to begin with, where there's no solvation of the sodium two site, there is now a solvation with a uh, completing an octahedral coordination sphere with a water molecule which is in direct contact with this small uh, uh, vestibule that is in, again in, con in contact with the intercellular environment. So that was a very direct insight into well, how are the first stages of releasing sodium to the intercellular environment, and like that start exploring the sodium gradient because once sodium is lost, it won't rebind with the very low intracellular sodium concentration. And that also led us to then some in insights to what is then the, the basis for, for this access to be um, uh, available uh, to the sodium two site. We found that there was flexibility, unwinding and flexibility of a, of a conserved glycine nine residue proline motif found in the uh, uh, transmembrane helix 5 of, of, of this transporter system, um, where we could see then that this would open up for it. And if we compare our different crystal forms, both uh, the highlight and the, the lipid cubic phase uh, based crystal form, we could see that where we have flexibility between the two forms was exactly in this TM5 that you see here in blue, and also coupled to that in the N-terminus of, of, of this transporter system that you see in, in red. 
So one moving the uh, together with the other, it seems, or certainly they are connected, coordinated in, in, in their flexibility. And that flexibility allows for some salvation, getting access to the sodium two site. Um, and, and the more flexible, the more sort of dynamic the, the salvation will be. Um, so that also brought us to a, a sort of first model of, well, how could then uh, the transport switch sides and actually start uh, releasing on the intracellular side, where we could see that it would then be a model of sort of what we have called a balance between two penalties, so to say. So in the outward uh, occluded state that I showed for LUT to begin with, you have this exposure of a hydrophobic vestibule, which is an unfavorable situation. Once you close that, on the other hand, well, then you get another small penalty, namely the deformation, the unwinding of the TM5 helix uh, at this motif. So either you have one or the other, but we believe this is probably a dynamic inter, uh, uh, interchange between the two states. But once you are in the intra, uh, uh, inward facing uh, state, inward oriented uh, state, there's the chance, the opportunity for sodium to be solvated and released, and there uh, the, the transport system will move on in the functional cycle. Since then, we have actually also determined in collaboration with uh, uh, Klaus Lueland and, and Ulla Geda, and, and also in, in, in collaboration with, for example, Harold Weinstein and J Jonathan Javich in, in New York, uh, structures of, again, Luti actually adopting the same state. That was a particular mutant uh, affecting this N-terminal binding. Um, uh, w8 uh, in the N terminus mutated to an alanine uh, allows for, for, for new states to be stabilized, in particular in the presence of phenylalanine. This was also supported, by the way, by Scott Blanchard's lab with single molecule FRET studies that also uh, justified um, what we had from the LUT in this mutant form, namely also this inward oriented occluded state similar to MHS, MHST. And again, we see clear uh, signs and indications of TM5. Uh, flexibility. And actually, we had also earlier done some uh, molecular dynamics simulations together with Weinstein and Lei Shi's group, uh, also showing that ex exactly the uh, TM5 dynamics are important for the salvation of, of the sodium 2 site and therefore the continuation of the functional cycle. So, this is just to give you an example of well, how from structures, we, 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 from, from many of the partial reactions in a functional cycle, like uh, for uh, the SLC6 transporters, structure and, and biochemistry, mutational studies, um, other approaches like single molecule threat and so forth, so forth, play together really well in establishing a good mechanistic understanding of how these transporters work, which at the same time then informs us very well also on how can this mechanism be explored, or, or, or regulate it in a way, for example, with inhibitors, so that we can maybe also use it medically. And, and for example, the dopamine transport and, and, and serotonin transport, or not least, are indeed very important targets for, for, for medical drugs. So we, we reached, for example, here from this, the combined studies of UT and MHST, a good understanding of what, how are the mechanisms of sodium release uh, once we reach inward-oriented states. So. Um, that, that was MHST on, on the basic me mechanism, but actually something we also found to be interesting is that, well, MHST on the, like LUT actually, they both have quite a broad substrate specificity, but and it's to, to some extent overlapping, but it's also different. So MHST is a very active, uh, as mentioned in the beginning, a very active, uh, active tryptophan transporter, for example, uh, unlike LUT, which is inhibited by tryptophan. Um, and on the other hand, uh, MHST doesn't seem to bind, for example, alanine or glycine, whereas you can actually make LUT uh, transport in particular uh, alanine very well. So there are also differences, um, and we thought this could be interesting, and we crystallized and determined then structures also of MHST with different substrates. We had already the structure uh, by tryptophan um, that uh, Lina Mailinaskate had, had determined so beautifully together with Joe. Um, and we had now new structures uh, determined by uh, Durota and Kauline and also with the help of Joe and, and others uh, with, with phenylalanine, tyrosine, porfluorophenylalanine as an, a mimic of tyrosine, also with leucine, isoleucine and valine, for example. So covering the broad uh, substrate specificity range that we have for this transport system and we managed to determine very many uh, fine structures. Again, in continuation as a uh, collaboration with uh, Matthias Quick and Jonathan Javich. Um, and we could see then that there are indeed, of course, as to be expected, differences in, in how they bind different substrates in the middle of the membrane, uh, in the core of the, of the protein structure. Um, so 
clearly sort of discerning between aliphatic substrates and aromatic substrates, also ranging dramatically in size from about 140 ong uh, cubic angstrom for the small substrate valine to uh, about 230 uh, cubic angstroms for tryptophan, for example. This was also seen for LUT that there was variations, of course. But if you compare the, the variations between LUT and, and the MHST uh, transporter that we looked at here, uh, well, we could see here that then um, with LUT, it's, it's, it's really about a central um, amino acid that forms part of the, amino, uh, the substrate binding pocket that sort of has side chain movements that accommodates different substrates. Whereas with MHST, we see not only side chain movements, but also actually a main chain flip. So it can actually be in two uh, modes, uh, a, a small and a, and, and a big mode, so to say. Small for the uh, branched uh, aliphatic amino acids and, and big for, for the aromatic uh, substrates. Whereas LUTI can only adopt what is quite similar to the small mode um, uh, compared to MHST. So that provides probably MHST this broader range. Um, this uh, central residue, phenylalanine and a methionine in, in uh, methionine 236 in MHST, which is in the middle of this switching motif, uh, is a phenylalanine in, in, in LUT, uh, GMG or a GFG uh, um, motifs, um, and also been pinpointed earlier, for example, by, by again, molecular dynamic simulations in the Weinstein group understanding again how substrate specificity and, and recognition takes place in, in the LUT system. What we see at the same time is also that with this switch we also see a, a, a sort of dynamic change of, of, uh, of water mediated uh, interaction networks that uh, sort of accommodates uh, interactions with a completely conserved uh, glutamic acid residue in the middle again of the structure of, of the SLC6 transporters. It's conserved in all of them. Um, and, and seems to be important for dynamic interchanges of, of, of hydrogen bonding uh, patterns, probably uh, involved in, in dynamic processes associated with transport. So uh, if we then compare to the general family and for example to all the human transporters, we can see that this middle uh, or this motif, um, um, GMG or GFG is quite there's some characteristics of it. A small amino acid, typically first alanine or glycine, in certain cases also cysteine, and um, and then a, a big hydrophobic residue, typically uh, uh, rather hydrophobic in the middle, with some few exceptions. Some of them even having the biggest one, a tryptophan, for example, the glycine transporter. That seems to make sense. That would be very bulky. And then again, a, con a completely conserved glycine in the third positions, uh, uh, third position of this motif. Um, and if you compare then MHST and LUT to, to, the, uh, to the mammalian ones, we can see that in particular the amino acid transporters SLC6, 18 and 19 uh, are actually quite uh, close to MHST compared to, um, to, to some of the others or well, GABA transporters to some extent also. So that gave us some interest in trying to see well what happens actually if we do some of the things that make MHS, MHST similar to LUT or similar to the amino acid transporter SLC619, for example, in human. This, by the way, has become very topical, by the way, because it actually forms a tight complex with the ACE2 receptor, which is also, as many will know, the coronavirus receptor. So it's also actually a target site for corona infection, uh, this amino acid transporter system. Um, so we tried actually to introduce then the phenylalanine uh, mutation, and then we see clear uh, changes in 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 in, uh, in preference now for substrate. It seems to lose the ability to now bind aromatic substrates, um, and perhaps it by introducing the phenylalanine instead of a, of the methionine, we restrict the main chain to only take the small conformation. That would be one idea. That could be something to investigate, of course, in the future from from, from the further crystal structures, and we can see that indeed. Uh, for example, the uptake of, of, of tryptophan uh, is completely uh, blocked with this mutation, uh, methionine to phenylalanine or, yeah. Sorry. Now, switching gears a bit, I would go to the glycine transporter, which is of the same family, and I, where I mentioned actually this would, for, for this particular uh, substrate recognition motif would, in, instead of a methionine or, or a phenylalanine, actually have a tryptophan in the middle of the motif. So glycine is a very interesting neurotransmitter. Besides being, of course, a, a, an amino acid, uh, it's, it's, actually, it's also a very important uh, neurotransmitter. And it's actually uh, both uh, working in excitatory and inhibitory uh, mechanisms. So it's 
Glycine by itself is a direct neurotransmitter and an activator and the agonist of glycine receptors, which are uh, depolarized, uh, so hyperpolarizing uh, uh, chloride channels that will lead to inhibition of neurons. Um, whereas, for example, glycine is also the co agonist of the NMDA receptor, uh, a glutamate receptor. So um, that means um, uh, together with, with glutamate, it can actually activate uh, downstream neurons. So it has a complex neurobiology and therefore is also uh, very interestingly uh, implicated in, in many uh, brain disorders where, for example, excitation in, inhibition is, is skewed. And it's been for a long time that glycinergic signaling has been uh, uh, addressed, for example, in, in treatment of schizophrenia. Um, there has been approaches for targeting the NMDA receptor, which is inactive uh, or, or, or not active enough uh, in such conditions. Um, but another approach could be to simply uh, uh, target the glycine transporter and thereby actually increase the activity of, of neurotransmitter glycine in the system rather than uh, uh, activating the, the receptor. Um, and for that reason also it has been uh, uh, targeted um, and there are, sorry, um, the glycine transporter has been targeted and there are inhibitors identified, for example, bitopertin has been through uh, clinical testing and, and actually showed effects in, in, in uh, some phase two trials, uh, whereas in, in phase three where they had to reduce dose, uh, there was uh, less effect and it is currently not active uh, in clinical testing. And that was because the glycine transporter is also found, for example, in blood cells where it's important for glycine uptake for heme synthesis. So therefore, uh, there we go. It would be really great to develop maybe new inhibitors that could be more specific to glycine transporter and neurons. That's certainly one important uh, future goal in this system. So uh, the glycine transporter project has been ongoing for, for several years, more than five years now actually, uh, and been uh, uh, spearheaded by Azadeh Shazava, uh, who is now an assistant professor in OHS and uh, worked uh, as a postdoc on this project for several years now. Um, um, first uh, in a collaboration with Rush and then for, for three years as an iPod postdoc together with uh, Tomas Schneider uh, uh, and, and Thornton in, in Tomas Schneider in, in Hamburg and Thornton at the MPI. Um, and then also in a continued collaboration with, with Rush. Um, and uh, at EMBL, very much also involving Gleb Gorenkov and also some very important uh, programs from Fabio Dallantonia uh, and at Rush, not least Roger Dawson, uh, who was the project leader starting the whole project uh, and approaching us, uh, working also closely together with Peter Stoller. Later on in the project, also we involved, uh, we got involved also in collaboration with Markus Seger and Ivan Zellermann and co-workers uh, at the University of, of Zurich. Uh, in, in their development of, uh, of, of synthetic nanobodies, which turned out in the end to be very important for this project. So uh, early on, it, it worked through sort of a tr traditional approach, or, or I, know, I wouldn't say traditional, but a typical approach in membrane protein uh, structural biology uh, until very recently, namely that you had to go through very many different construct designs to find the, um, the output protein with say truncated termini and maybe shortened uh, loops, maybe stabilizing mutations that allowed you to, to grow crystals of the protein. It has suddenly changed a lot with the use of mammalian cell expression systems and cryo-EM approaches, but this has still been a, a very important approach that we followed for a long time. And with that, there were several generations of, of the glycine transporter uh, constructs uh, developed in particular uh, at Rush uh, by Peter Stoller and, and Roger and, and, and more and more also involving uh, uh, Azadeh of course in, in the construct designs um, and including also fusion protein constructs for example as, as an approach. Um, early on we actually managed to get crystallization hits. They never really diffracted well using the highlight approach, the high, high lipid, high detergent, detergent solubilized lipid and protein approach. We, we managed to grow very uh, large crystals, very many different crystal forms from different constructs, but over and over again, we, we never really managed to get good resolution. We did see, however, a very important stabilizing effect of, of lipids, for example, brain polar lipids in particular was very well uh, stabilizing uh, to the protein stability, as you can see in the, in the lower left uh, panel here, uh, by some eight degrees, for example. Um, and otherwise protein constructs were really well behaved and, and um, stable and so forth. Uh, and, and binding the inhibitor also uh, that we've been working on, an inhibitor from Russia's uh, libraries. Um, however, we never managed to get 
well diffracting crystals from this approach. We then also had tried over several times with nanobodies and, and psi bodies. And also here we see a very nice um, stabilizing effect from a sort of inhibitor bound specific uh, psi body design from Marcus's lab, Seeger's lab. Um, and then finally, actually, for the first time, we actually also with that particular series of psi bodies uh, that were inhibitor specific. Uh, from Marcus's lab, we actually managed to get crystals with the highlight approach again with with uh, with the nanobodies. But again, diffraction wasn't really very good. However, that actually led us to, for the first time also, crystallization hits in lipid cubic phase. We had tried that over and over again, but never really gotten any hits. But with that particular series of side bodies, we actually managed to get, and, and, and that construct design, uh, we managed to actually uh, get crystals in the lipid cubic phase. Very small microcrystals, of course. Um, or not, of course, but uh, so it was. Um, but actually, using um, a, a microfocus beamline approach at the P14 beamline uh, in, in Hamburg, that uh, of course as a day worked next to as an, as an iPod poster, uh, we finally actually saw promising diffraction patterns, very more, much more promising than the highlight crystals ever had shown. And this would go through a sort of uh, serial uh, helical um, line scan approach, uh, where it sort of systematically would go through the loop and shoot and uh, register a diffraction phenomena from, from individual microcrystals that came into to the, the series of, of diffraction experiments. Uh, and you can see here what kind of um, parameters was used here. So out of some almost thousand crystallization conditions in lipid cubic phase, uh, there was one hit condition that actually then showed indeed also crystal, um, uh, diffraction uh, properties. And then um, it started working actually with some uh, data sets uh, developing. Um, we had um, the first few mini data sets showing um, some seven, eight onks from resolution scaling statistics that were quite promising. Um, better development of, of reproducibility and so forth and, and more data sets to be collected. Um, and also improving the way uh, crystals were, were grown and presented to the uh, serial crystallography approach. Um, uh, better and better data sets were available. And in the end of 2018, we actually had a, a quite decent um, uh, data set from some 875 uh, data collection runs, giving altogether some 186 useful mini data sets that were scaled together. Um, here we were very great, uh, uh, importantly helped by Fabio's um, Control D diffraction data tools uh, software that will uh, a program uh, that will allow very many uh, small mini data sets from individual crystals to be compared and scaled uh, for those that actually uh, uh, correlate well and can form a data set together. So uh, in the end, uh, from the first series of crystals, uh, sorry, uh, we had a, um, a for some resolution data set derived from this approach. I mean, it's it's not your usual large single crystal uh, data set. This is a serial approach, so it's derived from uh, these almost thousand crystals uh, and very many um, uh, individual data sets. So um, uh, it, 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 the R factors and so forth will not look very good. Uh, I or SIG I will not look very good. Um, but what is very important to, to control is in, in particular the CC one half. Uh, which is a very good indicator of the actual inner uh, quality control uh, of, of the uh, data set. And actually, um, then moving on from such a data set, following some resolution, it, it, it seemed also possible to start looking at uh, molecular replacement solutions. And uh, there was now, of course, a search for, uh, for search models for molecular replacement. Uh, we had, uh, with the fusion protein construct that we used, uh, the uh, Likinase uh, fusion protein construct, a model, of course, and also for the nanobody. And then for the actual transporter, we managed to actually get hits with two structures. First, with the inward facing uh, MHST structure, actually, uh, of all, because it apparently had the right confirmation. And later on in the process, when, when also the inward oriented serotonin transporter structure was available from the Google lab, uh, that one also showed a very good hit. So uh, that actually uh, managed us to, uh, or we, from that, managed to actually build uh, the uh, asymmetric unit. Uh, from these three different uh, search models um, and, and actually showing then a, a translation related uh, dimer uh, of glycine transporter with the fusion protein and nanobody in the asymmetric unit of, of the, of the uh, monoclinic crystal form. However, there was many problems with this one. I mean, well, to some extent there was actually very nice maps I can show you here. 
for the first time, we saw very clear uh, unbiased features in the electron density maps indicating that indeed we, we see what we hope to see, uh, namely the inhibitor bound um, and also ions actually, and, and very nice features for, for unmodeled parts. But there were also parts that were more problematic, and the diffraction was, as I mentioned, only for Angstrom resolution. Uh, so we actually turned to a new construct, uh, a sixth, genera sixth generation construct uh, of the glycine transporter now, without a fusion protein. We tried also uh, um, with some stabilizing mutations, some some shortening of an extracellular loop, um, and altogether uh, giving us um, uh, this uh, C63 construct, uh, which was now expressed instead of insect cells that we have used until now, actually in mammalian cells. So that was another thing we turned to and which was also uh, part of um, uh, of an approach that we would like to, to, to try and develop. And that turned out to be really helpful because now a new crystal form emerged uh, that diffracted much better. Um, so now we managed to actually with the same serial approach to collect a 3.4 angstrom resolution data set from uh, some uh, 300 uh, mini data sets now uh, collected on this crystal form. And this was a, a lot of hard work. Uh, again, more than 2,000 crystals were, were, were tested from uh, last year until the end of last year um, from, from Azade, working full time in Hamburg on this over and over again and really getting all uh, the possible data sets um, that, that could be scaled together. But in the end, actually then producing very nice electron density maps from this crystal form uh, and clearly showing, uh, again, the inhibitor bound uh, pocket and, and, and structural features of, of how it's recognized and so forth. So um, all in all, I mean, it, it gave us some very nice new insights. So the glycine transporter in this particular uh, microcrystal approach adopts an inward oriented but inhibited state. We see that the inhibitor here that we just call compound one here, uh, but that is derived from some rush development, uh, binds actually quite differently from other known inhibitors of the same SLC6 transporter family. So the serotonin or dopamine transporter uh, inhibitors or, or, or modulators bind in a different approach in directly in the substrate side. Here we are more in the intracellular uh, release pathway binding pocket uh, with, with, uh, with this compound. So this is very, of course, uh, interesting for us to, to pursue further and see how can we actually take from this information on to maybe also approaching new ways of getting more neuron-specific glycine transporter uh, inhibitors, for example. Now, the serial data collection approach uh, worked, as I mentioned, extremely well for us uh, as it has been developed and set up uh, at P14 um, and, and, and with very nice uh, developing software. So I, it, it really opens some doors for, for things we, we couldn't do before and that really are very nicely and complementary to, for example, cryo-EM and, and more traditional uh, crystallography uh, approaches. So I, I foresee many uh, great opportunities there for sure. Uh, Thomas Sørensen uh, is now an associate professor at the Department of Engineering in Aarhus and he's actually looked a lot into this and is uh, taking over a lot of the responsibilities for uh, 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 structural biology in the so-called LINCS program which is funded by the Danish Strategic Research Council or Innovation Fund Denmark uh, where he's uh, developing for example uh, the tools and the approaches, the implementations in collaboration for example with uh, Novo Nordisk, the company. Uh, for, for, for microcrystal uh, data collection and, 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 and structural analysis and with the many advantages microcrystals offer for soaking procedures, for example, and so forth. Um, and has in investigated very many different platforms, different ways of mounting and presenting crystals um, and, and so forth. Uh, for example, using insulin as a, as a test case and producing very nice data sets uh, from this serial approach um, uh, in his work with Novo Nordisk, for example. And, and producing structures of insulin directly from microcrystals and actually also in situ directly from crystallization plates uh, using diamond uh, facilities also. So this certainly offers some new opportunities when you can work uh, directly for structure determination using microcrystals, maybe even in situ. Um, another approach we have used, um, actually also using MHST as a model, was to well investigate well how is for because for MHST actually the highlight approach worked really well actually for crystallization and producing uh, well diffracting crystals, but we wanted to actually understand better well what is the phase diagram, what is going on in different parts of a lipid detergent ratios variations compared to the protein, and Sophia uh, Trampari are working together with Carolina and Asade actually uh, on an EU. Um, um, PhD program by the ITN program RAMP, 
um, was looking very much into this. And getting into grips of understanding this, she actually approached a, a structure that we were very interested in, namely with methionine. So methionine seems to be uh, recognized by MHST, but other studies seem to indicate that it's not transported. So we, we, we don't see uptake, apparently, from uh, methionine as a substrate, uh, whereas we see it binding. And we can see in these uptake experiments where we see how different amino acids inhibit the uptake of, of a transported substrate, that methionine certainly also inhibits it. So it competes, it's not taken up, so we believe it's kind of an inhibitor, and we were interested in this. And using this uh, approach from knowing the phase diagram that she investigated for the MHST uh, system, and the, she actually managed to get microcrystals. We hadn't managed to we hadn't managed to crystallize it earlier, but now finally she actually managed to get microcrystals. Um, that was the best we could get. Uh, but then again, with the serial approach, working together with us today, she managed to then collect uh, very recently a three young stem resolution data set, working remotely actually at the same time we had the lockdown, but then with being allowed to to work. Um, uh, with two meters distance and so forth, uh, as I did, and and Sophia could collect a, a beautiful data set. And indeed, we can see now a nice density for the methionine bound at the binding pocket. It seems to bind similar to the aliphatic substrates, uh, like valine, uh, leucine, for example. Uh, so we are currently trying to figure out, well, what is the basis for it not being apparently transported? Well, we, we need to figure out. But certainly, it seems to adopt that. Um, we are also warming up for time resolved crystallography using a microcrystal approach and in a different way of doing serial crystallography, namely in the chip design that Aaron and uh, Pearson and, and Thomas Schneider have developed so beautifully and co-workers of course so well for um, uh, P14 um, uh, with Gleb and others. Um, so with P14 and the chip design um, and then uh, of course controlling a time series for example to laser flashes or maybe a pump probe uh, setups and so forth, there will be the possibility to then in different time series collect data sets from hundreds or thousands of crystals again in these chips. Um, and Sam, another student of the same RAMP program uh, that works uh, between uh, uh, Esko Oksan and in, in London and myself, Jan Aarhus, uh, has used uh, the calcium pump, uh, the calcium ATPase as a, as a model here and has found very beautiful um, uh, indications of controlling microcrystals uh, having them very beautifully displayed on this chip design, all the blue dots represent uh, crystal hits in, in, in the chip, and managed to collect as a proof of principle a data set at least, uh, in this case for an inhibited form, uh, the ADP aluminum fluoride trap form. It's actually a form that we're interested in because it's, of course, mimics the phosphor transfer reaction in a P-type ATPase where we have phosphorylation taking place. Um, and it's the opportunity to look at this reaction maybe at room temperature. We have earlier found that there is some interesting features of magnesium binding. We see two magnesium ions bound in this ADP aluminum fluoride complex, whereas we see fewer magnesium ions in, uh, well, that is one, of course, in other complexes. So we, we think we have a uh, dynamic two magnesium ion catalyzed reaction for the phosphorylation that we would like to investigate. And indeed, we actually do see for these room temperature data sets that we get from the serial approach with the chips here also, we. Uh, we, we actually see, for example, reordering of some very critical uh, residues that we never really could explain why they were so important from mutational studies, but that we now see actually reordering around the ATP site in ways that we think will be very informative of, of how phosphoryl transfer reactions will take place. So Sam is warming up for, for time resolved studies. Um, he has grown beautifully defined, very homogeneous samples of microcrystals. Uh, also now with a photo caged ATP in collaboration with Arwen, um, and uh, gotten very nice uh, samples that we were really hoping for. But um, and he was actually just about to collect data from these when we had the shutdown, unfortunately the lockdown, uh, the Corona lockdown. But fortunately, he managed to reproduce all this. So we hope very soon uh, the, to being able to, to collect the first data sets also on this photo caged ATP bound form and hope that uh, later on with the laser uh, control that we can see actual development of the phosphoryl transfer reaction from release of ATP uh, binding of magnesium ions and so forth uh, to the phosphoryl transfer site in the P-type ATPs. This is a very interesting reaction, we think, because it, it actually consumes some one third, maybe in brain up to three quarters of all ATP turned over in the body. So it's a very critical phosphoryl or ATP hydrolysis reaction that we are looking at here. Really important for bioenergetics also. So, uh, sorry. 
So finally, I would like to say, we also, of course, are very interested in the completely different end of the spectrum. Now I've been talking mostly on micromanagement of these amino acid transporters, uh, SLC6 transporters, but we're actually also very interested in growing very large crystals for, of course, a neutron, a neutron diffraction studies. And of course, one of the great points we would like to see is to maybe being, get a better understanding of hydrogen bonding uh, interaction networks from deuterated crystals of, for example, calcium pump and other membrane proteins that are involved in, for example, proton transfer reactions um, uh, and titration-related uh, mechanisms. Uh, again, Sam uh, has been working a lot with this, uh, actually together with Thomas also, who, who, who worked uh, for many years also together with, with me and Jesper Müller on the, the first crystal structures of the calcium pump. Um, and you can see, you can take it so and so long uh, with regular crystallization experiments to grow larger crystals and you can get fairly large crystals, but it doesn't really bring it there, even though you maybe even also increase the size of the drops there. Um, but, but again, actually investigating uh, different approaches and uh, not least with input from Esco Oxen on, on, on this approach and trying to work on a sort of uh, a phase diagram imagined approach. Um, so Sam turned to actually then trying to decouple nucleation and growth. Uh, so getting in smaller drops, nucleation going, then feeding the, the, the drops with more protein solution, as you can see here below. So first forming crystal nucleations, then adding more protein solution, 15 microliters added here, for example, after four days. And then you see how many uh, days after how crystals grow. And then actually you, there's actually clear indications of now having control over the situation for growing very large crystals. And he has actually also managed to, to collect data sets from these very large crystals at room temperature, for example, as a proof of concept for, for how a neutron diffraction experiment might go. So we are looking very much into that. Um, and that will be sort of a future perspective also, certainly in the completely other end of the spectrum of growing very large crystals of membrane proteins for neutron diffraction studies. And what have we else coming up uh, later on with neutron scattering studies, for example, of other aspects of dynamics in biological systems. Uh, that would be very interesting. So finally, uh, I'd like to conclude just with some uh, conclusions and perspectives. So I showed a bit on structure-based mechanisms of sodium-dependent uh, SLC6 transporters, amino acids and neutron fitter transporters. We showed that uh, TM5 dynamics is induced by, uh, are induced by sodium and substrate dependent outward inward uh, switching. And that this process seems to initiate uh, then sodium solvation and release from the driving uh, sodium two site. We have investigated also for the member MHST, a broad substrate specificity, how it operates with both main chain and side chain flexibility in the TM6 uh, transmembrane helix uh, region, uh, which is on wound in the middle of the membrane to accommodate substrate. Uh, and we can see that then this substrate accommodation distinguishes between aliphatic substrates like valine, leucine, isoleucine, also methionine, um, and aromatic side chains in a bigger pocket. We have then also investigated the human glycine transporter using a serial crystallography approach, determined the first structure of this uh, very important neurotransmitter transporter system uh, from microcrystals uh, obtained by lipid cubic phase crystallization. Uh, we have obtained uh, the best data sets at 3.4 angstrom resolution and determined a structure in particular of an inward oriented uh, structure blocked by uh, uh, the inhibitor, similar to the bitopertine inhibitor that had also passed earlier through clinical trials, occupying an intercellular pathway. And then for future perspectives in particular, uh, there are very many fantastic possibilities for time-resolved crystallography using these serial approaches that can help us investigate, uh, uh, for example, induced chemical reactions in, in, in enzymes, maybe binding events by adding in pump probe uh, approaches, uh, ligand binding to a, a crystal system, um, and any other the ways of photo switching, for example, ligands or cofactors, uh, and, and, and study the first processes of a dynamic um, change of conformation in a crystal system. There's obviously also uh, new ideas on the, on the many things with large structures are very well handled now. If you're interested in the structure uh, directly, well, CryEM offers a lot of new opportunities that I think is obvious to everyone. Um, and also now with high resolution CryEM, there's actually the possibility to actually visualize directly uh, from the CryEM um, uh, maps, uh, also hydrogen positions, both polar and apolar hydrogen positions. 
So that's certainly very, very exciting and, and should really go hand in hand, I think, with, with the NMX approaches also for, for hydrogen uh, bonding interactions, for example, uh, investigations of that. So we need, we will see a join a joint hunt for the hydrogen, I think, between NMX and cryo in two very different approaches, uh, typically you would say from large crystals or from uh, single uh, uh, particle approaches in cryo That will be very interesting to see also in the future. Um, um, and with that, I would finally really like to thank uh, the laboratory, my own group, um, a, a very uh, excited, uh, exciting group of people to work with. We are sort of overall defining ourselves more and more towards being structural neurobiologists. Um, we have different uh, projects, as uh, Sindra mentioned in the uh, introduction, uh, on different uh, transporter systems, um, and also actually working more now, also we're using uh, electron microscopy on uh, ultrastructures of, of membrane structures in, 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 in neurons, for example, the axon initial segment and, and synapses. Um, and then, um, of course, uh, also some more sort of um, cell biology um, implicated receptor systems where we will also like to do very much interdisciplinary approaches with cell biology uh, derived approaches. And we also have some activities in, in, in deep learning based approaches in structural biology. So typically people work in, in teams on different subjects, uh, postdocs and PhD students and, 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 and undergraduate students. Um, on, on the different subjects, and we have a great uh, time, I think, interacting also between the different uh, uh, projects uh, on, on very many common methodological approaches that we are using, cryo-EM, crystallography, scattering techniques, and uh, cell biological techniques, for some of being more and more important together with biochemistry. Yeah, and finally, I would also very much like to thank uh, great support, uh, both on, on, uh, from technicians in the lab and, and administration, and of course, uh, also from uh, fellowships and funding, not least from the No Notice Foundation and Lundbeck Foundation, um, that uh, generally support the laboratories with, uh, with with fantastic programs, and also for the many individual fellowships that are mentioned, hopefully on the way. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for that very interesting talk. Um, I hope you can kind of hear the applause. <laughs> 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 it's so peculiar. Um, I uh, uh, I would like to ask, just putting it in context a little bit, uh, the, the first part of the talk with the the sodium coupled transporters. These amino acids are going into uh, into cells for uh, for production of proteins, I assume. Yeah, what? both um, for for protein synthesis, but certainly also as metabolites in 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 the synthesis of many other uh, compounds like vitamins and cofactors and. For example, glycine is also a, 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 an important precursor for, for heme synthesis, for example. Um, so they, they are critical for very many aspects and also directly as neurotransmitters, for example. Uh, tryptophan is also the starting point for making, for example, serotonin and tyrosine for, for dopamine and so forth. Yeah. Right. Important signaling substances. Yeah. Where, where do they come from? What's on the outside of this cell? from the blood or what, where do these yeah yeah so that's yeah so for example uh, or gut uh, so uh, there are many active both peptide and amino acid transporters in the in the gut and then also uh, for example uh, of course uh, to the bloodstream so that uh, to, to um, so you can take them up and get them into for example as, uh, into cells for either biosynthetic pathways or protein synthesis and so forth yeah yeah right so while people collect their thoughts, I have a few more questions from from me. Yeah. I know, uh, you know, uh, these uh, membrane proteins they are notoriously difficult to crystallize because they like being in a membrane. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you know these transporters? Do you have? Are they fully solubilized by your detergent, or do they come with some favorite lipids that they typically have around them in the membrane naturally? Yeah, that's actually a, a very good point. Um, um, in certain cases, you actually see quite resistant lipid binding coming along with the protein from the expression host, in particular if it's probably lipids that in any case seem to be important cofactors for the membrane protein. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also why typically it has been used in membrane protein structural biology to, to try and have minimized uh, purification protocols so that you do least to sort of delipidate, delipidate naturally bound lipids. But we certainly see a very strong effect always um, almost uh, in adding lipids also that you see increased stability 
you can you can scan for particular lipids that are important for stability. For example, for the glycine transporter, uh, a polar lipids, negatively charged lipids, were very important for stability of the glycine transporter, for example. And we see that quite generally also. So um, yeah, that's um, how it is. And and do you know? Uh... <laughs> Can you be sure that your crystallized forms are are the relevant forms when you compare it to biology? <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, <laughs> yeah, I think it's certainly, in most cases, a relevant form. But you can certainly be sure that it's not the only relevant form. So of course, uh, things are far more dynamic in, in in real life. We try, of course, when we crystallize things, but and actually also for cryium, I mean, the better defined the sample is, the, everything goes easier, right? So. So one tries to sort of have conditions for defining a particular functional state. But even so, it, it, it will be dynamic in, in, in solution. I, I think that's, that's highly appreciated also now from the many single molecule approaches we can use, spectroscopic approaches we can use, molecular dynamic simulations. And I, that just goes hand in hand. But the best way of getting a starting point is from a well-defined structure of cryo-EM or crystallography uh, or, or NMR. Or, very well determined NMR structures also. Um, but then of course appreciating that this is only the starting point for then investigating the actual function through dynamics. Right. And and, and when we see when you showed uh, with the, the sodium coupled transporter, you showed these really nice cycle diagrams of different states with different configurations. Have you actually been able to trap the proteins yeah. in different states or is that an extrapolation of some sort? It's to some extent an extrapolation, but actually it, it has been trapped in almost all uh, states of relevance for, for, for these LS, SLC6 transporters. We're actually only missing one sort of major confirmation, I would say. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to, I thought it was a little earlier back here, sorry. Um, so, but both from collecting LUT and MHST structures, and also now um, we see many of the dopamine and serotonin transporter structures fall into the same categories here. So these uh, are all crystal uh, uh, X-ray data on crystals. Yeah, the latest structures from the serotonin transporter actually came from cryo-EM studies. Uh, so the ibogaine structure was with uh, cryo-EM also now, uh, but otherwise it, uh, they have been crystallized so since 2005. Uh, the first dopamine transporter uh, structure, uh, Drosophila, I think, was in 11 and then uh, or 13, and then um, uh, serotonin transporter in 16, I think it was. Yeah. So, but pretty much going step by step through uh, the uh, inward, open. Oh, sorry, outward open, outward occluded, inward occluded, inward open. Um, but what we are missing is the uh, return states. Actually, we only have one of the sort of two major confirmations of the empty return states. It's not even indicated here, I think. Uh, oh, yeah, it is actually here, LUTI, <laughs> substrate-free apostate. But then here are actually two confirmations, uh, an inward and an outward oriented somehow. Otherwise, we have pretty much all covered. Well, th this is very impressive. How, how, do you, how do you catch them? Yeah, so it's been both a combination of mutations. Um, you can see MHST that we determined in, in, in 14 apparently happened to, to, to really favor the inward occluded state, whereas LUT really happens to favor the outward occluded states that Guo determined. And then later from Guo's group also with LUT, the outward open uh, sodium only, no uh, amino acid substrate bound, uh, also worked apparently well in that confirmation, but, but then actually also with some stabilizing mutations. Um, so yeah. Um, Sodium concentration, ligand presence or not, uh, substrate presence or not, some mutations that might discourage particular states and therefore favor others um, has been the way of approaching it. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Hanna Wacklin Knecht at ESS. Thank you. Yeah, she's asking uh, what kind of lipids are used in the hillide system? Do they come uh, yeah. with protein or are they added and does it matter? what the lipids are and is this optimized <laughs> for yeah, it, 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 that that actually the method as such is not uh, limited to any particular lipids I would say so LCP there you need of course lipids that are compatible with the cubic phase formation uh, dynamic uh, whereas with highlights uh, where you are it's so it's more in a bicellar system so you form probably larger lipid detergent bicellar uh, complexes with the membrane protein that then apparently 
support a three-dimensional crystal so form. There we have seen it with many different kinds of lipids. Um, lipid mixtures, uh, like for example with uh, uh, soybean lipids, for example, or brain polar lipids, you can crystallize with those. Of pure lipids like POPC, DOPC, DMPC, uh, E. coli lipids, and so on. Um, it, it, I, I think it maybe just depends on what the protein prefers. So if the protein prefers some particular lipid mixtures or, or, or lipid species, those are the ones to, to focus on. And um, then it's, it's really quite flexible. So the large, very large crystals we grew of, of calcium pump is in such a system where you simply add, um, in this case, actually even native lipids from the, the ER membrane, uh, the SR membrane. Uh, mostly PC and and uh, and PE lipids, as it so happens, and a bit of PS, uh, polar lipids again. Quite flexible. Okay, thank you. So you mentioned that uh, the sequence here is actually quite similar to the recognition sequence in ACE2, the, the target protein for the COVID-19. Yeah, it's the, but the, the mammalian uh, transporter, uh, uh, which is homologous to MHST uh, SLC6A19, uh, or MHST is most cl most closely uh, similar to to uh, to this uh, amino acid transporter system in, man in mammals. That actually forms a complex with ACE2. So, um, and there are even structures of, of that complex now, very recent structures from um, Chinese uh, cryo-EM groups. Um, so, th this goes really fast nowadays. Uh, so, from actually uh, identifying an, an important target to actually determine structures with the most recent cryo-EM developments takes not very long, actually, if you can get expression. Mm -hmm. um, so there are structures of, of, of that transporter system in, in PDP and in bioarchive, actually. And, and, and can this help us? Uh, can this help us break this vicious Certainly. Certainly, because that would, next step will be to look at the, uh, the actual full-length membrane protein or membrane-bound receptor complex, for example, of, of the SLC6A19 with the ACE2 receptor. They form a complex. They interact with the spike protein. Uh, how is that uh, taking place? How is that sensitive to the functional state of the transporter, for example? What is actually going on here? There are a number of really important questions, I think, uh, and probably also the opening for, for identifying new ways of, for example, blocking a, a viral entry point. That would be good. Yep. <laughs> so with all this, this was uh, mainly uh, synchrotron data. Have have you started working at Max4 yet? Yes, we have uh, at Biomax, of course. Uh, not so much with our microcrystals. Uh, there we have uh, been, I mean, it's certainly not because we don't like uh, Max4. We like it a lot, and we are looking very much forward to continuation um, uh, with the Particular serial approaches here, we were very much dependent on on the setup for the P14 a beamline for the serial approach, which that Thomas has developed and Gleb have developed. <clears throat> but um, I would say uh, we continue doing very many things by crystallography and 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 very much on on, on biomax, for example, and now looking very much forward to to the develop or to the construction of of micromax, and and very much hope that the micromax will be a great great way of doing serial crystallography in the future. That's right. And once we have neutrons and NMX in place and yep. the big crystals grow, what what will what will we learn more about these systems that we can't see today? Yeah, I I, I think in particular for self salvation, um, we learn a lot on how salvation is 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 well, you could say interacting with the with the protein dynamics. Um, so I think that's something we'll be looking at. Um, how is salvation involved in, in, for example, substrate recognition and and so forth? So so the many things we can learn from deuterated solvent, uh, hydrogen bonds with probed by deuterons, of course, um, could be a very exciting um, development. I think. Uh, but as I said, certainly also going hand in hand, most likely with cryo-EM, as we certainly realize. But that's now we shouldn't forget that what we saw from cryo-EM was very high resolution samples, also very ideal samples like apoferritin that really have a, a very uh, well behaved uh, sample in for cryo-EM. That's not your standard sample. So, uh, for example, circa pump, I don't think right now we wouldn't be able to determine uh, cryo-EM structures, for example, that would show us any hydrogens. 
I think that would need some work. <laughs> um, so for that, the NMX and the Cry EM probably should go hand in hand, and hopefully, similar to to high resolution X-ray crystallography, can support uh, a complete integral picture. We have a question from Australia. Oh my goodness. People come to these things that wouldn't yeah. come if it were in Lund. Okay, this is uh, Paul Smith, my previous colleague. He's coming to you from Adelaide, and he'd like to know, was the addition of the inhibitor uh, resulting in resolving the inward orientation an expectation that the inhibitor blocked the two-state dynamic into the one state? And yeah. this with 5A to 3A rest solution. Yeah, um, yeah, the inhibitor I, I, I probably wasn't clear. So, so that was found in both crystal forms we had and worked on. Um, yeah, and it would be expected that it probably, well, uh, yeah, it probably that it that it would bind from the cytoplasmic side. But but exactly what kind of state would be obtained, we didn't know on forehand, um, and where it would bind and so forth. Uh, not directly, actually. There were certainly some functionalities of the inhibitor that might point to some particular overlaps with with the, the, the amino acid substrate, but and then there was some mixed behavior of competitive, non-competitive inhibition uh, that also indicated that there might be something that switch. Now, in hindsight, certainly tells you that probably it might be associated with an inward-oriented state, uh, and therefore only have some partial uh, competitive inhibition uh, by uh, glycine, for example, that stimulates probably rather the outward-oriented state when it binds. So, um, yeah, um, but but definitely, I, I think we haven't done all the control experiments to say, but I'm pretty sure that the inhibitor was critical for also stabilizing the protein. We, we saw a very strong stabilizing effect of the inhibitor itself. Um, so to actually at all get crystals, I think the inhibitor was important. They are inherently very flexible, these transporters, and that's the whole nature of how they work. Yeah. Well, it's quarter past four. So it's probably time to wrap up. Uh, thank you so much for this, Paul. It was really thank you so much, Sindra. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. yes, we'll we'll see you around once we're allowed to see people around again. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody for uh, for checking in and listening today. Uh, this was the last talk of the colloquium series for this term. So we'll be back after summer, and hopefully we'll soon be having actual coffee together again. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sindra, and thank you everyone for listening, and thanks for great questions. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.